York, the jewel of the north, situated just below the Yorkshire Moors and the Dales. An ancient city. These days, it's more famous for ghosts, stagnites, and Judy Dench. But under your feet is a rich history, full of Vikings, Romans, and knights. So, let's get stuck in to the history of York. With the death of King George III, the Prince Regent took the throne as George IV. Prior to this was the time where Europe turned its cannons to the emerging threat of Napoleon, and terrible wars were fought, with the Battle of Waterloo concluding these wars in 1815. Now, focus is once again on arguments between Catholics and Protestants, and politics between Whigs and Tories. Though, I'll quickly clarify the political situation around this time. During the wars, the Napoleonic Wars, in 1812, Spencer Percival, the Tory Prime Minister, was assassinated by an anti-government agitator, sending shockwaves throughout the empire. This results in a vote of no confidence as the new Tory candidate, Robert Jenkinson, is rejected, but he eventually gets the job back when the Prince Regent becomes king. Right. And now, well, the Tories are still in power, with Robert Jenkinson, the second Earl of Liverpool, as Prime Minister. And he'll retire in 1827, after suffering a stroke, leaving Chancellor George Canning as PM. Only for him to have a stroke also. So he retires, and then dies on August the 8th. The next chap, Frederick Robinson, a.k.a. Uh, Viscount Goodrich, uh, then takes the top spot as Prime Minister. Uh, this will only last a year before he is ousted as leader by none other than Arthur, Duke of Wellington, the hero for the Napoleonic Wars. And as his Home Secretary is Sir Robert Peel. So, this is where we are. Sort of just needed to clarify this. More importantly, the Industrial Revolution is in full swing and York is entering a new age. Though, not everybody likes the idea of this Industrial Revolution and a group called the Luddites have emerged, opposing the use of machinery to replace workers. This group started out in a textile industry and are now spreading around the empire, staging protests at every opportunity in an effort to shut down industry and move towards older, more traditional workers. Oh, and by a protest, I don't mean standing around with a placard. The term spanner in the works may come from this lot. It might not, but a lot of suggestions that it does, as the Luddites often would sabotage machinery by doing just that. That was what they meant by protest. They would basically bugger the machinery up, often destroy it, especially in New Zealand, where they were rife. Their peak was in the Regency era, but they are even proving a pain in the bum now. The Luddites are considered backward thinking, and several factories have already resorted to shooting a few who protest outside their gates or bugger up their machinery. There's even a government response that brought military action against them. It's a capital offence. 14 Luddites were hanged outside the York Castle prison. Oh, and in case you're wondering what's going on there, well, quite a lot. For a start, under George III, a water mill was built in the private part of the tower, 
Uh, but this was powered by a steam engine, which irritated the inmates in a prison opposite. The overcrowded prison itself came under fire politically, due to it not being fit for purpose. In the era of public executions were becoming a thing of the past about now, and the method of hanging by strangulation was replaced by the quick, short drop and sudden stop method that we are familiar with. So they are no longer having big, massive crowd gatherings in the Old Bailey Courtyard. And by the 1825, the castle had been purchased by the local county, making it a government building. The prison itself was pretty much rebuilt using stone. So there we are. There we have it. But, as I said, York was entering a new era. And most people had fully embraced the Industrial Age, especially in York. For a start, the old decaying River Ouse Bridge has been demolished and replaced by the one we are familiar with today, designed by Peter Atkinson. It's quite a spectacle and was completed by 1821. It was an expensive affair, so a toll booth was set up to recover some of the costs. Uh, the shambles has always been evolving over the years, with many renovations during the previous century. Well, the same is occurring now, and if we take a stroll down the street in these times, uh, the pre-Victorian, sort of post-Regency, uh, we'd recognise many of the buildings that still stand and they've done so for hundreds of years. Although I doubt they'll be selling Harry Potter merchandise in the night. Also, if you know your chocolate and uh, candy, then the first Round Trees shop opens up in 1822. Uh, so all of you who like a pack of fruit pastels or are partial to Smarties, then consider this. This company goes back further than good old Queen Victoria. But before we get into her, old King George would pass away with no heirs, so his brother William would take the throne. Good old silly Billy. But prior to that, you have Jonathan Martin. Jonathan Martin was a scallywag, a nerdwell from Northumberland who had a rotten lot in life and ended up getting press ganged into the Navy. He served in the Napoleonic Wars, fighting at the Battle of Copenhagen. After he left the Navy, he became a tanner and a Methodist preacher. You'd think that that would end his tale from the boy witnessing his sister's murder to becoming a priest. But no, he is outspoken against the Church of England and begins disrupting the sermons in churches. He's becoming a right pest. Then he acquires a pistol and threatens to kill Edward the Leg, the Bishop of Oxford. By now, the authorities had had enough and Jonathan Martin was arrested in 1817, he's deemed mentally insane and sent to a lunatic asylum. Case closed. But what's all this got to do with York? That's all the way up in Northumberland, the Durham area. Well, in 1820, Jonathan Martin escapes the asylum at West Auckland. Yes, he's caught, but the next year, 1821, he escapes a second time. He's like a flipping Batman comic. So in the 1820s, he's working back as a tanner 
and a preacher, although the Methodists reject him. The cheeky bugger seems to have calmed down, and uh, actually writes a couple of books, including an autobiography. And by 1828, he's married to a second wife, his first having dying of cancer, and now he's living in York. Once again, you'd be forgiven for assuming his tale has ended, but oh no. In 1829, he is again plagued by mental illness. He's attending a church service at the York Minster. People are singing, the organ is playing, all is going well. Only Jonathan Martin can hear a strange noise from the organ that won't go away. That night, when the congregation was heading home, poor old Jonathan takes it upon himself uh, to deal with the strange noise coming from the organ. Once the night watchman had gone, Mr. Martin lights a lamp and hides in the tower. He then proceeds to set fire to all the woodwork in the belfry by piling up cushions and prayer books. By morning, the tower was ablaze and the choir was ruined. But the part of the building known as the choir, that is, uh, not the chaps that sing. As mentally ill as Jonathan Martin was, he was no psychopath. But the choir was destroyed, as was the pulpit and the organ. And the roof had come crashing down. The church would need some serious refurbishment. It took until the next day for the fire service to finally get everything under control and put the ruddy thing out. So it's quite lucky that the fire service was uh, established last century, eh? Mr. Martin had escaped via a window, but due to pamphlets he's been given out, he's arrested, and his trial was at the courts at York Castle. He was tried and convicted of a capital offence, but he didn't swing at Tyburn, no, he was deemed too mentally unstable and sent to another lunatic asylum, the famous Bedlam in London. Oh, this time he wouldn't escape. He would spend the rest of his days there, nine years, drawing disturbing pictures of an apocalyptic future with London in ruins. And uh, this wouldn't be the last fire at the Minster Church either, as we will discover over the course of this video. But he was not arrested by the police as we know them. It would have been a localised police force and pretty archaic for its time. Yet, in London, uh, there was a bit of a reform going on. In 1829, Sir Robert Pill has just had the Police Act passed and Scotland Yard is born. And soon these reforms would come sweeping across Britain, including York. During this time, I will hastily mention that the Duke of Wellington resigns as Prime Minister, as there is much call for parliamentary reform. It's a long story, not getting into it right now. But the Tories are out, and the Whigs are in. And Charles Grey, or the second Earl Grey, becomes the new Prime Minister in 1830. You might remember that name. The Earl Grey tea bags? They're named after him. Then Charles Grey resigns in uh, 1834, 
and King William puts another Whig as PM, William Lamb, aka Melbourne. But he's ridden with scandals, and soon the Tories are back in power once again. And who's in charge? None other than the Duke of Wellington. But this government is not fit for purpose. Again, I'm not going into the details, there's a lot of politics going around about now. But either way, old Welly resigned, after less than a month, leaving Sir Robert Peel as the new Prime Minister. But only briefly, as a few months later, he's also forced out. William Lamb, again, takes the power for the Whigs. Oh, <laughs> and do you think today's politics are chaotic? This certainly puts it into perspective. As for Robert Pill, soon he's disillusioned by the Tory party that he belongs to. He leaves to reform the new Conservative Party, who were the ones we know today. To really confuse things, they also get called the Tories, probably because of William Pitt the Younger, who was Prime Minister during the Regency. He called himself an independent Whig, or a Tory, so the name seems to have stuck. But last video, I did promise we'll be dealing with the reign of Queen Victoria, and this happens in 1837, when William IV passes away with no heirs. He leaves the throne to his young niece. She's only 18, and wakes up one morning to find the Bishop of Canterbury, William Howley, and Lord Conningham waiting for her. Clad in only her dressing gown, Victoria was proclaimed Queen of the United Kingdom. Now, continuing with people, I'll introduce you to some respectful gentlemen of this new Victorian era. I'll start off with Jon Snow. No, not that one. Or that one. This one. Hooray! He's born in York to a poor family and baptised at All Saints Church. Even at a young age, his proving has got a mind for mathematics. Though, he won't be destined to become a mathematician. Most likely due to the unsanitary flooding of the River Ouse, he's working out connections between water, cemeteries, and general contamination. Despite his background, he'll become a pioneer in germ theory and epidemiology working his way up the ladder in the various hospitals. He'll become vegan, even in this time, he's teetotal and is quite germophobic. Now, around this period, uh, there's a deadly pandemic known as the Blue Death, and it's sweeping across the world, killing countless people. The cholera outbreak came in two waves, from 1817 to 1837. There's 20 years of this. It hits the north of England, including York. I only mention it here, despite avoiding other plagues, because Jon Snow plays a direct part in this, and is born in York. Now, around this point though, he's in Newcastle, and he's figuring out how to combat this cholera epidemic, using the methods he's tried and tested, are getting quite the name for himself. Nowadays, he's even got a pub in Newcastle named after him. Although Jon Snow is more famous for being the one who inspects the cholera outbreak in London, he traces it to a single pump in Soho, which leads to a revolution in hygiene. He is also well versed in chloroform and anaesthetics, but unfortunately, he'll die of a stroke in 1858 at the age of 45. Though incidentally, 
Sir Robert Peel was also known as the Blue Cholera, as getting arrested by these new bobbies was known as getting collared. Hence nowadays, when you're nicked, it's known as having your collar felt. And then we have the Hansom family. Yorkshire born and bred, they're from St Martins in the city itself. Joseph Charles and the younger Edward. He's the son of Charles and the nephew of Joseph. Unlike Jon Snow, these lot are pretty well off. They become architects, specialising in the Gothic revival movement that dominates the Victorian age. Although they have left York to live elsewhere by then, but their legacy remains in the city. Out of this trio, a Joseph Hansom has another legacy. He's the chap who invents the Hansom cabs, another icon of the 19th century. Another fascinating part of this period is the invention of the photograph. Not Yorkshire, I'm afraid. The photo is French. But they are capturing real images for the very first time, allowing us to glimpse into the past uh, so we can see what parts of streets like the Shambles have changed between now and then. Again, someone from that period would find York pretty much unchanged for the most part, and vice versa. York certainly embraces this, and it becomes a centre for photography. And as the century moves on, it gets quite the following, as various other people experiment with the idea of manipulating light to create photographs. The Victorian age was also the age of the steam train. And in 1839, the York and North Midland Railway opens up a whole new world for people. Yorkshireman George Hudson, the man behind this, becomes known as the Railway King, as railway mania hits the British Empire. Soon, he'll be connecting railways all the way from Newcastle to London eventually Edinburgh. He's pretty much the reason why the North is famous for its steam trains and chaps like this were paving the way, connecting the mines and the steelworks that were the backbone of the industrial age. George Hudson also has his hand in politics, as do most powerful people in the era. He's the mayor of York, an old-school Tory, though he switches to the new Conservatives that are growing in the Whig-controlled city of York. He'll also become the Conservative MP for Sunderland. Uh, but unfortunately, he'll also face ruin by 1853, as uh, allegations of financial fraud hit him hard. He is forced to sell his railways uh, to pay for his debts. While all this is going on, by the way, Sir Robert Peel is the new Conservative Prime Minister. And in 1846, uh, the Whigs win the election as John Russell begins his term. Back to York. You also have gaslight appearing in York and waterworks, bringing York up to speed with cities like London. After all, uh, this is a golden era for the North powered by hard work and ground-breaking new machinery. And in the 1840s, York has its own ironworks, providing metals all over the empire. The Walker Iron Foundry. The gates to Kew Gardens in London? These chaps. The gates to the British Museum? These chaps. It's a fantastic time to be in York.
obviously, it had its ups and downs. Every city does. And for surrounding areas, such as the mining town of Leeds, life was tough. But minerals were needed to keep the industry going, and factories needed to manufacture the machinery that would build even bigger structures. York now had the means to truly connect all the areas and more railways were added by the decade. The Romans could but dream of such an empire. By now, York Minster was failing as a centre of worship, following yet another fire in 1840. Without a roof in the aisles, the rebuilding pushes it into debt, so in 1850 it's suspended, and would remain suspended for eight more years, until the Dean, Augustus Duncombe, managed to get it all back up and running. I will also mention that uh, around this time, in nearby Tadcaster, uh, just out of town, the Hartleys have been brewing beer for a hundred years. They brew the good old tried and tested porter that was a staple of the age. Good old fashioned stuff. One of their workers is a man called Samuel, and he gets his son John on board. But in 1852, when Hartley died, the son, John Smith, took over the business and renamed it. He renamed it the John Smith's Brewery. He has better ideas than selling porter and begins brewing pale ale, because the, the water suits it better. And this proved popular with the locals. Now, John Smith's Brewery is run by John himself and his brother William, and they've moved their brewery to a new one down the road and they're getting quite a good name for themselves so eventually you'll end up with John Smith's brewery and Samuel Smith's brewery which is named after John's nephew he, he inherits the old brewery and uh, they operate just a short walk from each other and bloody good beer it is too oh uh, this isn't the John Smith's brewery this is the King's Arms at the Ooze Bridge it's just a decent pub and does sell Samuel Smith's beer. But let's focus on the river for a moment, because aside from the Ouse Bridge, you're pretty much still relying on small ferry boats to cross from one side to the other. Not anymore, because in 1860, William Dredge is given permission to build the new Lendl Bridge, and that allows people to cross further up to the north of the river. But yeah, about that. It is a failure. It collapses within a year. But hey, that's the industrial age. There's some hits, there are some misses. It's all about the learning curve. These are new ideas, using new technology. You can't get it right first time all the time. But anyway, people still want that bridge. So next up is Thomas Page, whose designs are a part of this new Gothic revival. This version was completed in 1863 and is the bridge we know today. It certainly makes it easier to get across the city which is also supported by the Ouse Bridge down river. Uh, what have the Victorians ever done for us, eh? <laughs> but we're now in the time of William Gladstone, member of the Liberal Party, and his rival Benjamin Disraeli of the Conservative Party. These are the two main parties in British politics about now, as the Whigs and the Tories have become obsolete and no longer considered relevant in the political arena. Again, disclaimer, there's a lot more to it 
that's just the gist, but if you want to, you can look it up. I don't run a political channel. But the last Tory to hold power was the Duke of Wellington, back in the 1830s. The last Whig was Russell, who was defeated by the Liberals in 1866. Following that, there was a political reform in 1867, allowing more men to vote. Yes, men, as the women's suffragette movement isn't really a thing at the moment, and they won't even gain victory until the next century. Right now, many men have only just been given the right to vote. Let's look at it like that. And this isn't the only reform. The prison at York Castle is about to go through more changes. Because in 1877, the Prison Act is put in place. As we've learned over the course of this series, the prison system, especially in York, is chaotic. It's, and it's archaic. This prison isn't really fit for purpose. It was only really intended to be a debtor's prison. Go harking back centuries. Now it's overcrowded, uncoordinated, and all the prisons across the British Empire resemble this, hence the Reform Bill. Now, rather than being part of a private council, it's overtaken by the government who control the prison system as a network under one umbrella. Right, so you've, let's go to the actual area where we are around York Castle. In the Old Bailey area, not been the Bailey in years, you've got the Crown Court, where you're tried and convicted, then slung in the prison next door, or opposite if you're female. The court itself is still in use today, unlike the prison, which will cease holding public prisoners at the turn of the century. It will still hold military prisoners, just not very many and the castle itself would end up being declared a national monument owned by the city. <laughs> this old Norman castle has had quite the journey, finally able to retire and to become the museum we know today. Continuing with reforms, uh, the British military's involvement in the Crimean War and the Indian Mutiny have proven that, if anything, the army is in need of a change. And there are many elements, from the number of soldiers to the purchase of commissions, I mean, the army wasn't run on merit at this point in time, but on the rich gentry who are often inexperienced and clueless. Uh, there is so much to this, to detail here. Oh, these are less than the basics. But you have the Franco-Prussian War in 1870 that proved that the Germans were far more advanced than our own forces. Things needed to change. So the government implemented the Kabul reforms. And the army gets a much needed boost. Pretty much becoming the army that you'll see in movies like Zulu. You know where we are from here. York is affected by this, as the old East and West York regiments, they're getting a few tweaks. Old school regiments, by the way, who'd fought in everything from the Seven Years' War to the American War of Independence to the Napoleonic Wars, to name a few. Now, they've been stationed all over the world. Now, they are renamed the East Yorkshire Regiment, and they'll have some spanking new buildings built during the 1880s as several drill halls are built. They are involved in the Boer War and the Anglo-Afghan War. The East Yorks are more decorated than a wedding cake from Wigan. But aside from political reforms, by now, York is central to a good network of railways. It's becoming quite the hub up the north. And it's not only trains, but trams, as these new tram lines are appearing, making travel easier in an ever-growing city. The Golden Age of Steep also has a rival, as a new form of transport has arrived in York, the automobile, the car. 
and the first automobile in the city is purchased by the Round Trees Chocolate Company. Yes, uh, they bought it as a part of an advertising campaign. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> that must have worked. I could just imagine the spectacle as all these no local northern folk watch as this contraption passes by. But there you have it. In 1881, a new bridge is opened that crosses the southern part of the River Ouse near the castle. Skeltergate Bridge. Designed by George Gordon Page after an act is passed several years prior. And again, this is built in the Gothic Revival style. I wasn't kidding when I said this look was popular in the Victorian era. It really is all the rage. Unlike the other two bridges, they really went to town on this one, as it not only requires a toll to cross, it boasts a house where the toll master himself would live. So yes, if you have a coffee in Sophie's, you are sitting in the old toll house from the 1880s. This is where the chap used to live. <laughs> not bad, eh? You also have an art gallery opening in 1882. Uh, there have been various art exhibitions over the last 20 years. Uh, after all, the 19th century has so much brilliant art to offer from all, all over the world. Uh, not just the empire, but everywhere. And now, finally, the city has its own permanent place to view said art. From the best eras of recent history, it's all exhibited here. And the York Art Gallery is still open today. But there was no doubt in anyone's mind that the world was changing. And with a variety of newspapers, the 80 odd thousand residents here would be updated with events from all over the empire, from India, China to Africa. And given the military that resided here and the barracks in East Riding, people would have seen firsthand that controlling such a vast empire would be a monumental task. You also have the construction of a grand new building on Clipper Street, the York Magistrates Court, beginning in 1890 and completed in 1892. It was part of this Gothic revival in architecture, and the courts are still used today. Next door to this, you have the York Institute of Art, Science and Literature, also in the Gothic revival style. It had everything from a gymnasium to six classrooms and a main hall. It had a lecture theater, reading rooms, and offices, Although these days, you'll know it for being the location of the York Dungeons. It was the Conservatives who saw the turn of the century, with the third Marquess of Salisbury, Robert Gascoigne Cecil, running the show. Meanwhile, Queen Victoria is an old woman by now. She's 80 and the monarch with the longest reign in British history. Until she gets beaten by Elizabeth II, that is. But a year later, in 1901, she'll pass away and the throne is handed to another legend, King Edward VII. As the British Empire enters the Edwardian age,